Bloomberg is now in your dashboard with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Yeah, it's free with the latest version of the Bloomberg Business app. Gives you access to every Bloomberg podcast, live audio feeds from Bloomberg Radio, plus hear the latest headlines at the click of a button with Bloomberg News Now. Yeah, it's the Bloomberg Business app. Get it on your phone in the Apple App Store or on Google Play. Just download the app, connect your phone to your car, and get started. It's presented by our sponsor, Interactive Brokers. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. President Biden has ended the immediate threat of a government shutdown. He has signed a temporary spending bill that extends government funding into early next year. Bloomberg's Amy Morris has the details from Washington. President Biden signed the legislation yesterday while in California for a summit of APEC leaders. The bill maintains existing funding levels and pushes a fight over the federal budget into the new year, when House Republicans say they will push for stiff spending cuts. It splits the deadlines for passing full-year appropriations bills into two dates, January 19th for some federal agencies, February 2nd for others. This short-term package allows lawmakers to regroup over the Thanksgiving holiday while talks continue on spending and policy agreements. In Washington, and I'm Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Amy, thanks. Well, the stopgap bill does not include funding for Ukraine and Israel. In fact, new U.S. aid for Ukraine risks slipping to mid-December and maybe longer, casting doubt on Washington's ability to keep up the flow of weapons that both the Biden administration and the Ukrainian government say is vital. The soonest Congress could complete negotiations and pass new Ukraine assistance is mid-December, nearly two months after President Joe Biden first requested $61 billion for the country in its war against Russia. Well, now, Karen, let's Let's turn to the latest on the war in the Middle East. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is defending his country's raid on the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza City. He says Israeli troops uncovered a Hamas command center underneath the facility. We had concrete evidence that there were terrorist chieftains and terrorists, their terrorist minions, in the hospital. And in fact, they fled. As our forces approached, they fled. That's why we had no firefight. We entered that hospital with Arabic-speaking Israeli doctors, with incubators, And we had no firefight, but Hamas was using the patients in that hospital as a human shield. Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke on the CBS Evening News. Meanwhile, the Israeli military says it has taken control of Gaza's harbor. People in the southern city of Khan Yunus say Israel has dropped leaflets telling them to seek shelter. And Syria says it's intercepted some Israeli missiles aimed at targets in Damascus. Well, back in the U.S., Nathan, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit is wrapping up in San Francisco, and we're learning more about President Biden's deal with China's Xi Jinping to crack down on fentanyl. The White House agreed to remove a Chinese organization accused of human rights abuses from its sanctions list in exchange for Beijing's cooperation. A Biden administration official tells Bloomberg taking the Institute of Forensic Science off the Commerce Department's entity list was the only way for the U.S. to make progress on the fentanyl crisis. And at the APEC summit, Karen, the CEO of Alphabet said he expects China to be at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence development. Speaking with Bloomberg, Sundar Pichai warned the world's two biggest economies will have to work together on developing a framework for AI. My sense is there is no way you make progress over the long term uh, without you know, China and the U.S. deeply talking to each other on something like AI. So I think that has got to be an integral part of how you make progress. So I think I'm glad to see it. And, you know, we have to lay the foundations. The good thing is we are still in early days of the technology. Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai's comments come after business titans, including Apple's Tim Cook and BlackRock's Larry Fink, attended dinner with China's president on the sidelines of the APEC summit. Well, Nathan, we're seeing fallout this morning from Elon Musk's endorsement of an anti-Semitic social media post. A Tesla investor is calling for Musk to resign, and IBM has now suspended its advertising on X because of the proximity of its ads to Nazi posts. Bloomberg's Ed Baxter has the story. This comes amidst a swirl of controversy surrounding X and Elon Musk in the past couple of days. Watchdog group Media Matters reported out that IBM, Apple, Oracle, Xfinity, and Bravo all had a placement. IBM opted off, saying IBM has zero tolerance for hate speech and discrimination. Meanwhile, the White House has reacted to a Musk post that it says is anti-Semitic. NSC spokesman John Kirby. We certainly abhor comments uh, that are anti-Semitic in tone and certainly uh, don't associate ourselves uh, with the comment. Musk endorsed a post that said the Jewish community pushed hatred toward whites. In San Francisco, I'm Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. 
Okay, Ed, thank you. Moving to markets now, we're watching shares of applied materials in the pre-market. They're down more than 7%. Reuters is reporting the largest maker of chip-making machinery in the country is facing a criminal investigation for allegedly violating export restrictions to China. The report says the Justice Department's looking at whether applied materials sold hundreds of millions of dollars of equipment without the proper licenses. And Nathan, the escalating fight between the U.S. and China for technological dominance has triggered one of the most stunning reversals of corporate strategy yet. Alibaba Group has walked back plans to spin off and list its $11 billion cloud business. Alibaba shares dropped 9% yesterday, wiping out more than $20 billion of market value. On the flip side, Karen, we're watching shares of Gap. They are higher by more than 18%. The retailer reported third quarter profit that exceeded forecast. Same store sales fell for a fourth straight quarter, but that declined was less than expected. Stronger results at Old Navy, Gap's biggest brand, offset weakness at Athleta and Banana Republic. Crude oil has collapsed into a bear market, Nathan. It's down 20 percent from its September high. Crude's run of four straight weekly declines, so long as losing streaks since May, has come despite collective and voluntary supply cuts by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies. The losses have also been abetted by the evaporation of an Israel-Hamas war risk premium, as fears the conflict would expand and disrupt oil supplies have so far not materialized. And it's time now for a look at some other stories making news around the world. And for that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Amy Morris. Amy, good morning. Good morning, Karen. The pressure is building for New York Congressman George Santos to resign or face expulsion. It follows a scathing House Ethics Committee report. Bloomberg's Nancy Lyons has that story. Committee Chairman Michael Guest says the evidence uncovered in the House investigation is more than sufficient to warrant punishment. And he plans to file an expulsion resolution. Wisconsin Republican Congressman Brian Stile tells Bloomberg Sound On the findings are alarming. The illegal actions that are uh, set forward in this report are incredibly concerning. The report alleges Santos used campaign money to pay off his personal bills and to make luxury purchases. Santos responded to the report saying he would not run for re-election. In Washington, Nancy Lyons, Bloomberg Radio. And that expulsion resolution Nancy was talking about is expected to be filed by 9 o'clock this morning in Washington. A New York appeals court says the gag orders imposed on Donald Trump by the judge in the state's civil fraud trial against him are unconstitutional, and the restrictions were put on hold pending further arguments. The decision is a major win for Trump, who has publicly lambasted the judge for overseeing the case and accused him of rampant bias. This is just one of six trials Trump is facing as he seeks re-election. California officials say a section of Interstate 10 in Los Angeles that was damaged in a fire last week will reopen earlier than expected. Governor Gavin Newsom said the mile-long stretch of Interstate will be open to traffic again weeks ahead of time after the state doubled the crews working on those repairs. One thing we can guarantee you is we will be open five lanes in both directions at the latest Tuesday of next week. Fire officials say the fire was deliberately set and an arson investigation is ongoing. Secretary of State Antony Blinken yesterday signed a civil nuclear cooperation agreement with the Philippines. At the signing ceremony, Secretary Blinken said it is part of the U.S. support for clean energy projects there. With the Philippines' leadership, we're also working together to develop a nuclear energy sector in their country to fuel a reliable, secure, and affordable clean energy future. The agreement allows the U.S. to legally export nuclear equipment and material to the Philippines for peaceful uses. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Amy Morris and this is Bloomberg. Karen. All right, Amy, thank you. Well, we do bring you news throughout the day right here on Bloomberg Radio. But now, as Amy said, you can get the latest news on demand whenever you want it. Just subscribe to Bloomberg News Now to get the latest headlines at the click of a button. Get informed on your schedule. You can listen and subscribe to Bloomberg News Now on the Bloomberg Business app, Bloomberg.com, plus Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. It is time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update, and here's John Stashauer. John. Karen, big game in the AFC North to kick off Week 11. The Bengals and the Ravens, they both had four-game win streaks come to an end this past Sunday. Baltimore started things off with a 75-yard touchdown drive. The Ravens then trailed in the second quarter. Gus Edwards in the backfield. Lamar to throw. Fires down the middle. It's deflected and caught on the deflection. Nelson Aguilar, 20, 15, 10, 5. He 
flips in for six. Aguilar on the deflection. Ravens in the end zone. And WBAL about a minute and a half later, another Lamar Jackson TD pass. The Ravens beat the Bengals 34-20. to Baltimore is 8-3 and, and in first place. Cincinnati is just 5-5 five and, five and in last place. NBA in Miami, the Heat won their seventh in a row. Jimmy Butler scored 36 in a win over Brooklyn. Oklahoma City made it five of the last six, winning 128-109 at Golden State. The Warriors have lost five in a row. They're just one and five at home. They went 33 and eight at home last year. They were without the injured Steph Curry and without the suspended Draymond Green. MLB owners approved 30 to nothing in the move of the Oakland A's to Las Vegas, and they waived the relocation fee. The A's will be in Oakland in 2024, but the plan is to be in a new stadium in Vegas by 2028. It's unclear where they might be playing in between. It's the first time an MLB team has moved since the Montreal Expos went to Washington in 2005. Baseball has given the 2025 All-Star Game to Atlanta, who had it taken away after that voting law was passed in 2021. John Stash, our Bloomberg Sports. From coast to coast, from New York to San Francisco, Boston to Washington, D.C., nationwide on Sirius XM, the Bloomberg Business app, and Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager. China will be at the forefront of artificial intelligence. That's what the CEO of Alphabet, Sundar Pichai, is saying. He says it is important for the U.S. to collaborate with China on both regulation and innovation uh, when it comes to AI. Pichai, along with executives from Microsoft, Citigroup, and Tesla, have been meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden at the APEC summit in San Francisco. After those meetings, the Alphabet CEO joined Bloomberg's Emily Chang and told her the world's two biggest economies do need to work together on on AI regulation and development. It's not going to be easy, but, uh, but I would start from this premise that AI will proliferate. So this is not the inherent nature of software. AI advances will get out to you know, all countries. And so it is naturally the kind of technology, I don't think there's any unilateral safety to be had. We all have a shared incentive to solve for safety. You know, you could have AI go wrong in one country that will impact every other country. So in some ways, it's like climate change in the planet. We all share a planet. I think that's true for AI. So now that you know that that will be true, I think you have to start building the frameworks globally to make progress. I've seen encouraging progress. Uh, when the G7 happened in Hiroshima, I think it was a good start. You've seen more progress. The UK AI Summit last week, the administration here, the White House has been uh, leading the way as well. And I saw good, encouraging announcements even yesterday for US and China to start having a dialogue on AI. Well, that was my next question. Should Chinese regulators be part of this conversation on AI regulation? My sense is there is no way you make progress over the long term uh, without you know, China and the US deeply talking to each other on something like AI. So I think that has got to be an integral part of how you make progress. So I think I'm glad to see it. And you know, we have to lay the foundations. The good thing is we are still in early days of the te technology. So laying the foundations now will allow us to work through the tough issues and build a common framework over time. How do you think AI, and obviously the US presidential election coming up as well, how do you think AI is gonna further test election integrity? I think, you know, over time, it's going to lower the barrier for creating, you know, artificial information, which may or may not mirror what's happening in the real world, right? And that barrier will come down. Mm -hmm. So in this cat and mouse game, how do we amp up our defenses uh, against that? We are in early stages, right? You know, we were one of the first companies to announce a watermarking technology for image generation. It's called SynthID done by DeepMind, and we are providing API access to it. But all of us need to tackle it. The, these are areas where regulation will have to play a role, right? And I think governments will have to, over time, pass regulations about what is OK for you know, some of this synthetic content. And, and so which is why I think you have to think about it you know, together. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman has said repeatedly he wants to know more about what's happening with AI in China. 
What do you know and what do you not know about where China is on AI? From what I can tell, they're making deep investments in AI. The scale of AI research talent in China is just simply astounding to see. So I think you know, in some ways this question, China is going to be at the forefront of AI, and, and you know, I think that's a given. Um, and so the question is, how do we work over time, both for you know, other countries to make sure you're making progress in AI, and over time, how do we develop the frameworks where you know, countries can coexist peacefully in a world in which AI will be you know, everywhere? You know, President Biden actually just said he doesn't see the U.S. decoupling with China, but the world does seem to be on a path to two separate internets. Do we continue in that direction, and what does that mean? It's tough to say. Uh, you know, things go through in phases. Uh, I think we are definitely in a phase where there are more forces pulling it apart. Um, but, you know, inherently these technologies also facilitate easy exchange of information. So I think there are countervailing forces as well, so I think it's tough to predict. I do think information wants to flow freely by nature. So, you know, my hope is over time, uh, you know, things do couple back again. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.